Well, just while we're getting set up, uh, let me say thank you, Sharon, for your very kind introduction and uh, for your invitation to uh, participate in this webinar. I'm very pleased that uh, there may be interest on uh, your side of the country in the work that we've been doing. So I am uh, presenting uh, this webinar as part of the Center on Standards and Assessment Implementation. Uh, one of the federally funded content centers that was funded in the, in the last competition. And this is, the, I, I suppose, the renamed um, Assessment and Accountability Comprehensive Center. And it was the Assessment and Accountability Comprehensive Center that um, we actually did the work under. And so um, I feel a little schizophrenic now. I'm presenting this with my new hat on with work that we did under the previous um, um, content center. So um, my purpose today, uh, John, if you can change the slide, please. The purpose today is I, I wanted you to, first of all, uh, get a sense of what we developed in terms of our online formative assessment program, uh, why we did it, and some idea about the content and structure of the program. Um, we also have had a chance to implement um, this in a pilot, and indeed, prior to it becoming online, we were able to implement some of the content face-to-face, -face. and we have some lessons learned from um, our implementations, and also I wanted to share with you some potential models of implementation that other states have tried. So that's what I'm going to try and focus on today in the session. Uh, next slide. <coughs> so in terms of the overview, um, here's the agenda. I want to give you some background to the program, just briefly, so at least you know where it com came from, an overview of what the program uh, consists of. And then I'll be showing you a sample of one of the modules, just a few slides from one of the modules, so you'll get a sense of uh, the, the content and its organization. And then we'll talk about supporting implementation, some of the lessons learned, and some of the models that have been tried in different states around the country. Um, I put chat box in discussion because I would encourage you, as I've, I've left some spots for questions and comments, but if you have questions that come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat box and post them, and uh, I want to make this as interactive as possible. <clears throat> John, next slide. So as mentioned to you, um, this professional development was developed in a collaboration between the Assessment and Accountability Comprehensive Center, which no longer exists, and um, the North Central Comprehensive Center at McCrell. Um, and it was supported by the federal government, and as such, everything we produce is absolutely free to anybody who wants to use it. So there's no charge at all for using these materials. Um, next slide, please. And so, as I said, any work that we do going forward will be done under the Center on Standards and Assessment Implementation, the new um, content center. Next slide. So some, some background, um, how did this program come about? Well, several years ago, the AACC and the NCC worked with the state of Iowa um, to develop a statewide implementation and formative assessment. These folks were very keen. Um, they'd been a member of the formative assessment SCAS right from the beginning. I was very keen to have a statewide implementation. The chief at that time saw formative assessment as the route to changing practice and to successful student achievement. And so we had a lot of support from the department. So a collaboration uh, between the AACC, the North, Car Com uh, North Central Comprehensive Center, and the Iowa Department of Education. And so we developed the content and tried out the content of much of what you'll see today. Uh, when we actually came to put it online, we revised it quite a bit based on lessons we'd learned through our face-to-face -face implementation. So this lasted about two years, I would say. Um, one of the goals of the, the project was to ensure that everything that we put forward in relation to formative assessment as a process or a set of practices was research-based. We didn't want to sort of beat people over the head with research content, uh, but we wanted to make sure that everything that we presented 
was grounded in the literature on formative assessment or uh, learning theory and so on. And so once we developed our content collaboration, we then uh, piloted it with the Northwest Comprehensive Center. So they actually did an online pilot with um, some of their folks at the State Department and some of their professional development leads across the state. And they gave us very helpful feedback. Uh, it was pretty brutal feedback in the beginning. Um, but, you know, as all good feedback, you learn from your mistakes, and we improved. And uh, certainly I want to acknowledge uh, Claire Gates and the, the Comprehensive Center for their sterling work and the state of Washington for helping us with refinements um, on this work. We were extremely grateful. So let me now, with that background, next slide please, John, go into telling you something about the, uh, the program itself. I'm not quite sure why we can't see um, all the slide, but um, I'll just assume that it's a kind of closed procedure where you can fill in the, the letters for yourself. So in terms of the, the purpose of the program, we have two core objectives in this. Next slide, please, John. Uh, the first objective was to help increase teachers' knowledge about the process of formative assessment what formative assessment actually entails in classroom practice. So we wanted to increase the knowledge base, and then we also wanted to provide a support mechanism for teachers to implement this process effectively in their classrooms. And um, these were our primary goals, to increase knowledge and to increase skills. And the general view we have taken in this um, formative assessment module is one, as I said, that comes from the research that formative assessment is not a specific test, but rather a set of practices which have been shown when implemented effectively can improve student achievement. Next slide, please, John. And so the, the orientation of the, the program is that formative assessment is a process used by teachers and by students. We're very clear, um, as the literature is clear, and many other countries and their implementation are very clear that it's not just something teachers do. Students are equal stakeholders in the process. It's the means to provide ongoing feedback to both students and teachers while learning is occurring. It's not something that happens after the event. And it's integrated into daily teaching and learning. So this is the, the view that we've taken in this um, program which corresponds very much to what the formative assessment SCAS views as effective formative assessment, what the literature suggests, and the implementation of many countries around the world. So we do not see it as a particular test or instrument. You'll never hear anything that in this uh, um, module, uh, this program about, about formative assessments. We don't see it as something to provide a score. We want to make sure that, that people are getting substantive insights into student thinking. It's not something that happens periodically, as in interim assessment. It's something that is ongoing and embedded into the instructional process. And certainly, it's not something that teachers do. And we regard the students as equal stakeholders in this. Uh, next slide, John. Now, we use this framework that I developed um, a few years ago as the, um, the, the glue, really, if you like, for the whole program. Um, and this fronts every single module. And basically, each module addresses one of the dimensions or two of the dimensions of this feedback loop we see as um, formative assessment in practice in the classroom. So for example, we have uh, modules on learning progressions, learning goals, criteria of success, uh, on eliciting evidence, on providing feedback, on the classroom culture, on peer and self-assessment, which you can't quite see here, but that will be down on the bottom right. So this is the glue, um, and we come back to this at the beginning of each module so that participants can see, oh yes, I see what element of the process we're on right now and where we're going next and where we came from. So we really try and keep this as the, the, um, the framework, the framework for our sessions. Um, next slide, please. 
And Margaret, I will add that <clears throat> um, when I played with the presentation uh, format layout, uh, I was able to change the, the whole slide. So if people are not able to see the entire slide, maybe try presentation view. And again, that, that button on the bottom right hand side. Okay, thank you, John. So let me tell you about some features of this the program now. Um, our goal in putting it online was to maximize the flexibility for its use. So we didn't see it as a one size fits implementation. Um, we wanted to have um, consistent formative assessment content, um, but that the, use, the implementation of these modules could be flexible. Um, we didn't make it content specific, but we feel, and certainly that's the feedback we've had, that it's adaptable to specific content areas and across grade levels. So for example, in Washington, they had a group of math people together, and they were able to add content to it that was focused more on mathematics, still keeping the, the general idea of formative assessment, but some of the examples they built out in terms of uh, the content. And we see it as, as adaptable um, across many different levels of the system so that it could be used within the school, it could be a district. Um, some people have used it on a regional basis. And um, I'm going to tell you an example of using it at, at a state level. So the whole idea was that uh, we provide this content, but how it got implemented was really up to those folks who were doing the implementation and wanting to learn. Um, one of the things that I think got cut off here, um, that we, we did make a significant part of the um, program, was teacher learning communities. We have, in each of the modules, in addition to content and activities, we've also um, provided work that can be done in the in intervening period between one module and another for TLCs to engage in. Next slide, please. We, we thought this was important to do because the, um, the teacher learning communities, and I um, can't really see the quote here, but I will um, share it with you, that what a lot of, uh, certainly William and Thompson in 2006, some of the work they've done and the work that's gone on subsequently with people like Caroline Wiley and Christine Lyon from ETS, they have uh, been finding that teacher learning communities focused on formative assessment appear to show the greatest potential for improving teaching practice and student achievement. So the idea here is, and we think this is maximally beneficial, is if people are using content of these modules in whatever format uh, that works for them, and then engaging in teacher learning communities. Um, with the activities that we provide for the communities, and of course anything else you want to add, that seems to be um, one successful avenue to implementation in the classroom. Next slide, please. Um, and just quickly, uh, to help us or remind us, uh, this is from um, Christine Lyon and Caroline Wiley, who've done quite a lot of work um, on teacher learning communities. And they talk about this model of learn, practice, reflect, revise. And so that's what we're seeing um, as our modules supporting the learning. And then they, we suggest ways to practice, a formative assessment. And then the learning communities give them an opportunity to reflect and revise. Um, and we have found that teachers get to a deeper understanding of formative assessment and also uh, teacher learning community provides support for different levels of understanding. So um, we've made that quite a, um, a significant component of our modules and um, certainly feel that that's integral um, to the work of implementation. So let me now move to the, some specifics in relation to the program overview. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please, John. Uh, so um, these are the, the modules that, that we have. Uh, we have seven in total. We have an introductory module. 
Um, and this is this is for people who are basically going to be implementing the program, uh, be the leaders, if you like, of the program. It gives an overview and uh, ideas about um, implementation, how to go about using the modules, and the, the content of the program. And we have quite a lot about TLCs in there as well, and the advantages of using TLCs, and how to set up effective TLCs. And then the modules go through um, all the dimensions of the cycle, the feedback loop that I showed. All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. So, um, have I been muted? Can you still hear me? No, oh, you're good. You're good. Okay, thank you. So, we have a general overview, and then the subsequent models, we go into specific details about um, those elements of formative assessment I showed you in the, in the feedback loop. Um, the modules are quite ex extensive, um, and again, they are divided into specific lessons um, so that implementers, or even if a group of teachers is doing it for themselves in a school, they can decide how long they want to spend on the content, uh, take what they want from it, uh, try implementation, and then come back. So it's very flexible in that sense. In terms of supporting materials, next slide, John. Um, each module has three components. There's a, an extensive uh, facilitator's guide. Um, it, it is very extensive, where we give some uh, research background to the topic. Um, we give notes for uh, pre-planning, for planning during, and for um, implementation advice and then intercession advice, what you might be wanting to do in between uh, lessons or modules. The PowerPoint presentation is provided as a self-managed um, Adobe Captivate with a voice script as well as a PowerPoint. So you can either use the, um, the, the PowerPoint presentation just play it, it has the presentation, it has the voiceovers, or you can stop, you can, you can discuss. Um, it's very flexible as that, but there is a voice script. And then there are lots of handouts which comprise activities, information, articles. Uh, we give articles for further reading if people want to engage in that during the, um, the modules. Next slide, please, John. And so um, you can use the Voice Adobe Captivate presentation, or you can mute it if you want to and communicate the content as a facilitator. Um, the script of the uh, PowerPoint is available. Um, and what we've included in terms of our learning structures are we have a lot of turn and talk where people are able to process or make sense of what they're learning about. There's a Your Turn where we ask people to engage in activities. Um, around the content. We have a consolidate your learning, and that's a means towards the end of each section of the module that you're able to um, really do something to help you make sure that you've understood what it is that you're trying to learn about. And then the final thing is to try it out, and that's usually at the end of the module to take back into, your, into the schools uh, to try it out in the context of the teacher learning community. So let me just stop here now. If you can go to the next slide, John. <clears throat> and if people have any questions or comments at this point, the next thing I'm going to do is show you um, some excerpts from one of the modules so you'll have a better idea of how all this content uh, that I've talked about actually plays out. But I'll just pause for a second and um, give anybody a chance to ask any questions. Okay. <clears throat> and. Um I uh, muted all the uh, participant lines, so if you'd like to unmute your own line, you press star six. They may ask you to press star six again to mute it back. Or you can ask questions in the chat box. Okay, <clears throat> well, I'm not seeing any questions, so let's move on now. And what I'm going to do is to show you an excerpt from one module. And these aren't in particular sequence, I've just excerpted them. 
just to give you a flavor of how what I've talked about looks like in the actual module. Next slide, please, John. So this is module four, uh, where we focus on um, eliciting and interpreting evidence. And if you recall, that's one of the dimensions or elements of the feedback loop that you saw earlier. And I'm sorry you can't see this full slide, uh, at least I can't, so hopefully most of you can. <coughs> Next slide, please, John. <coughs> Excuse me. So, oh, I can't see any of this at all. Uh, okay, well. Uh, you, uh, Margaret, on the bottom, uh, there's a little icon, looks like a little face, and it says pick a layout. And if you pick presentation, you might be able to see the entire slide. Okay. There are three. Three types. There's gallery view, speaker view, and presentation view. Yeah, I, I pressed and can't see. Mm. Okay, well, never mind, not to worry. Sorry about that. Um, no, I, I got completely lost. Okay, well, I'll just keep on talking. Um, and hopefully you can all see the slides. So on this slide then, this is slide 20, John, that we should be on. Um, each module has a number of lessons, and we open the um, the module, and every module has the same format, where we identify what the content of the lessons are. And um, in the introduction, we give what the main messages of the lessons are, because learning goals and success criteria are integral to formative assessment. We also provide learning goals and success criteria for each of the um, each of the modules. <clears throat> and as you can see here, there are five lessons in this particular um, module. So people have a sense logging on exactly what they get to see. Next slide, please, John. In the next slide, you can see the um, the main messages. Uh, for each lesson. So, for example, lesson one, the main message is the use of carefully planned tasks, questions, and observations can provide teachers with evidence of student learning during a learning sequence. So, each of these main messages is posted, and in the facilitator's guide, we give a lot more information about the main messages and what facilitators need to bear in mind as they go through the module in helping shape uh, the main messages as the content develops. On the next slide, um, you'll see, as I mentioned, that we have learning goals for each module. And here we want uh, teachers to, or participants to understand why it's important to elicit evidence and understand the criteria for quality evidence. We think this is important. Um, Quality evidence is important in any assessment, and it's just as important in formative assessment. So I won't spend time going through all of these. Uh, John, if you go to the next slide, then we can see the success criteria. Um, now, these are for the participants to guide themselves through the module. And so at the end of it, they're supposed to be able to explain why, when, and how strategies can be used to elicit evidence of student learning. And at the end of each module, well, we want to model um, good formative assessment practice. So at the end of each module, uh, we spend some time asking participants to reflect and to rate themselves uh, with respect to the success criteria, and then give them some suggestions if they feel they haven't met the criteria of how they can develop further. Next slide, please, John. Um, here again, you have the feedback loop. Uh, next one, John, which I said you, you ground, it grounds all the, um, the content. And here, we've highlighted the um, the specific areas of the feedback loop that are addressed in this content, in this particular module. Next slide, please, John. So this one, your turn, we generally try and give them um, an activity that's going to 
elicit some prior knowledge. And we think this is important for the presenter, for the facilitator, even for them, to get a sense of what they already know about the topic. So in this one, we're asking them what do you already know about the idea of eliciting evidence. And we do this in each module so that we start by eliciting some prior knowledge, which, of course, is what we want to model. We want to model effective pedagogy, and we know the importance of connecting new learning to prior learning. So we want to make sure that that's included. Next slide. And then once we've gone through these various um, introductory aspects, then we begin on the content. And as I said, we uh, focus on research-based content, although we don't necessarily um, call that out in the, the slides, but it's certainly there in the facilitator's guide. And we've also added a reading list in the facilitator's guide of all the work that we have used to come up with our content. So if people are interested, they can go and have a look at that um, and read read more, read the actual sources that we take our work from. So next slide, please, John. So in this, um, in this slide, we're really <clears throat> talking about a notion that Fred Erickson, in a beautiful paper, I wish I'd written the paper, in about 2007, um, talked about taking stock. That formative assessment is about taking stock of learning as it is developing. And so we spend a bit of time talking about this idea of taking stock, that you don't let learning uh, progress a long time before you take stock of where students are with respect to where you want them to be. Next slide, John. And then we also focus on, on this notion of getting inside students' heads. Um, and I think this is particularly salient in the context of the Common Core and Next Generation Science Standards. We know that the Common Core is supporting or encouraging teachers to uh, develop higher levels of thinking among students and deeper learning among their students. And so if we want students to be engaged in deep learning and being able to think um, critically and deeply about their learning, as they are learning, we need to get inside their heads. And so we talk about the importance of substantive insights. Laurie Shebert has a wonderful um, paper where she talks about, you know, we don't need scores. We need substantive insights into students' thinking. And our, this whole module is focused on how teachers can externalize students' thinking in a variety of ways through evidence collection so that they are able to get some insights into how students are thinking about this deep content to support them towards success. So that's very much a focus of this module. Um, next slide. We take a lot from knowing what students know. Um, and I think this is an, an important quote. This is one of the, the foundational works that we draw from, from the content for this the program. And what the committee said that good formative assessment requires radical changes in the way students are encouraged to express their ideas. So a lot of this module is focused on how teachers can help children express ideas in ways in which that gives them insights into thinking. Um, next slide. And, and finally, um, in terms of some of the research that we address, this one from um, Black and colleagues, Paul Black and colleagues. I don't quite know what's happened to the image. Uh, there is an image of the book, Assessment for Learning, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and what they talk about is more effort has to be spent in framing questions that are worth asking. And so, as you well know, a lot of formative assessment is premised on teachers' effective questioning and probing of student thinking. So we spend quite a bit of time in this module talking about questions and helping teachers think about how to develop good questions that are going to get at student thinking, are going to give them the insights they need so they can keep learning moving forward and develop that deep understanding among all students. So um, next slide, John. And then, you know, after we've done some content, then we have a turn and talk. And here in this one, we are asking them to think about questions that are worth asking. 
um, meaning ones that require some thinking and not necessarily a yes or no answer or what I call the guess what's in the teacher's head answer. Um, you know, what am I thinking? And therefore, everybody has to try and guess. Um, and then we, so once we give them an, an opportunity for activities, then we get into the idea of there's no single way uh, to collect evidence. Again, I'm not quite sure what's happened to the image here. Um, but we spend a lot of time talking about how the evidence they gather must be aligned with the learning goals and success criteria. Um, there's no single way to get evidence. There's lots and lots of ways. But as with any assessment, it has to be aligned with the goal. So if you're assessing state standards, they've got to be aligned with the standards. Similarly, informative assessment at the micro uh, fine grain size of the classroom then evidence got, has got to be aligned with the actual learning goal that's the focus of the lesson and the success criteria, um, the indicators of uh, progress. What are those demonstrations of understanding? And it may not come as a surprise to you folks, but I have to tell you that over the years that I've been doing this work, it is astonishing to me how hard it is for teachers to come up with the learning goals and the success criteria. They typically want to go straight to what the students are going to do in the lesson. And um, it's very hard for them to think about, well, why are they doing this? What are they actually going to learn as a result of it? Yeah, see, John said it's very difficult. And then when you ask them, well, okay, so if, if students are learning this, what are the indicators? What are those performances that you're going to be looking for um, in what the, I, I really like what Patrick Griffin always says in terms of what students say, do, make, or write. What are you going to be looking for that's going to tell you and equally importantly tell them that learning is progressing or it isn't and there's something that needs to be done about it. So uh, one of the modules is, is purely um, focused on learning goals and success criteria. And this one now is talking about aligning the evidence. So if one of your success criteria is that students are going to be ex able to explain a particular concept, then they better have an explanation task. Um, so we really spend a lot of time on, this, on evidence quality here. And, and I'll just go through the next two slides quickly because time's moving on. Um, so when we talk about evidence gathering, we talk about the importance of planning, planning ahead. It's not something that's just serendipitous in the classroom. It's actually planned along with instruction, uh, the kinds of questions and discussions, the observational specific tasks that students are going to engage in so that you will have the evidence as a teacher that you need. Next slide, John. And of course, that's not to say that uh, teachers can't get evidence on the fly or things don't happen spontaneously, um, but it can only be used effectively as evidence if teachers know what the criteria are that they're looking for and suddenly they see it in a way that they hadn't anticipated it. Um, so we really stress the importance of planning. So just go quickly through these next slides, John. Um, I'm going to race through them. Um, so the importance of formative assessment, making a decision, whether it's to carry on with the planned lesson or to make adjustments instructionally or to provide feedback. Uh, next slide. And then we give them an opportunity to um, generate possible strategies for eliciting evidence. Um, and we develop this idea in terms of your turn. This is one of the activities that they would actually do in the session. And then they have a, next slide, a consolidate your learning activity, uh, one of the handouts, um, and um, they are really building their knowledge here, um, and they continue to meet with their TLC after the module to think about ways in which they can collect and use evidence. So, and then finally, the try it out is the, uh, when they take it away with them, uh, they select one of the strategies, how they're going to use it, and share your experience. And one of the things that we did learn from um, our pilot with Washington State and the NWCC is that teachers want to try things out immediately. So we've built a lot of time um, into the modules for trying things out. Um, I'm 
a little leery about just trying out a whole load of different things, which is why I think trying it out in the context of the TLC is really important because they can keep coming back to it, keeping revising it, and so eventually it does become part of their independent practice. And so that's just a quick uh, ride through the content of one of the modules, an excerpt of one of the content, uh, some of the content uh, in lesson one. Uh, so let me pause there again and see if anybody has questions or comments. Things aren't clear at the moment. I know I'm packing a lot of information into a fairly short space of time, but that's the nature of the beast here. So I will stop talking for a second and see if there's any questions or comments. And again, you can use the chat window, or if you'd like to press star six, you can unmute your own line and ask questions. Okay. All right, so let me move on now then, because I want to um, end really with some ideas for supporting implementation. So if you're thinking, well, we've got these materials, they're pretty flexible, I could use them in a number of different configurations, um, then how, how might I do that? So the final section of this webinar is intended to help you think about that. So uh, next slide, John. It's pretty clear from um, everybody who's been involved in formative assessment, effective formative assessment. Um, unfortunately, some people still think that formative assessment is about giving more frequent mini-tests. But anyway, effective formative assessment really does require a change in practice. For some teachers, it's going to be a big, big change. Uh, you know, for those of the stand and deliver mode, it's a big, big change. For others, it may not be um, quite so much. It may be a bit more planful than perhaps they have been. But um, I'm pretty certain that for all teachers, there will be some change. And for some, it's a big paradigm shift. So one of the things that we think is important in considering this, this module is to think about ways in which this can become a cell for people. Next slide, John. And so we, we know that it does support effective teaching and learning. I mean, there's a literature in that, and there's a lot of anecdotal experiential evidence from those of us who've been working in this field for a long time um, and have seen how it can change teacher practice for the better. It also uh, is focused on the individual students, unlike um, other forms of data which get aggregated. This is very much at the individual student level, meeting individual students where they are. Um, I certainly think, and that's what we found through um, talking to, to states and thinking about these modules, it definitely supports other key initiatives, for example, um, uh, response to intervention, uh, very much part of the response to intervention where we're paying close attention to all children's learning, some children then needing more attention than others, and so it, and so it goes on. And certainly we see um, the formative assessment as being a critical aspect to the implementation of the CCSS and the, the next generation science. Um, and that's certainly something that the states that I'm involved with through the formative assessment state collaborative are focusing on this year, formative assessment through, um, through the Common Core. And the, the educator effectiveness, and in fact some states have included formative assessment in one way or another in their teacher evaluation uh, because they regard it as essential practice to being an effective educator. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we have found, um, or a number of things rather that we have found, um, is the lessons learned. And, and these are several aspects of our implementation, starting with Iowa several years ago, that we've seen um, are important. First of all, sustained leadership. This isn't going to happen unless there's leadership to support 
the modules, the support for professional development, and there's leaders at the local level who are committed to supporting this. Just not going to happen. Similarly, this idea of commitment to change. If people think, and I, I do underscore this, because if anybody who's on this uh, webinar right now is interested in this, then I think uh, the interest has got to be not for a quick fix, but for a longer term um, commitment. Because as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about changing teacher practice, and that can take time. And it requires ongoing professional development, which is why we put together these modules with the TLC component to it, so that there will be support for ongoing professional development. It's going to need time. People um, need to commit time to this. But we wanted to make the, uh, the program as flexible as possible so that we could be responsive to people's time constraints. They do need resources, so we've provided these resources, which we think are useful. Um, in other implementations, we've realized that access to experts is important, to have the, the content knowledge, and so we've put a lot of expert knowledge into this content. And peer coaching is an important aspect of um, implementing new practices. And so the idea of the TLCs has become very prominent, as I mentioned earlier. So let me just conclude now with uh, a few examples of some uh, implementations at different levels. So this was uh, a state implementation. It was the state decided uh, that the schools and school improvement were going to engage uh, with formative assessment um, for two years. And so these modules were used um, as part of that process, the content of these modules. Um, the idea was that school teams would, would come together um, three times a year for two days, and this was when this module content, it wasn't used in an online format, but it was used, the content was used as it is. Um, there would be two days, three times a year of this content. And then in the intervening periods, there would be school level coaching, there were coaches assigned to these school teams and webinars with experts because we wanted to make sure that it was access to experts and also the kind of school level coaching that uh, was important. Um, we see the TLC now as that we've included in this particular program as a proxy for the kind of school level coaching if external school coaches aren't available. Um, and this was pretty successful. Um, you know, some people saw it as a great opportunity to change practice. Other people, um, as you would get in any mandated um, professional development, uh, were less inclined. Uh, but in general, I think it was very successful, and the content uh, really made sense to um, the people who were in the face-to-face -face meetings. In the next one, this was another uh, state in combination with a comprehensive center, and this was a, a multi-year uh, project. Um, this state actually started with their own folks building capacity at the department level. They didn't want uh, anybody who was out in the field from the department talking about formative assessment in a way that wasn't consistent across the board. And so they spent some time building their own capacity then uh, they were able to embed it into state initiatives. For example, in this state, there was a very long-standing statewide initiative in math, and the math people spent a lot of time incorporating what they'd been learning into the, um, the math professional development initiatives. Um, a further development in this state was that the regional centers, um, I'm sure you all have them, they're called different things in different states, they were involved in uh, building capacity of the certain personnel in the regional centers so that they could provide the ongoing support of this content into the um, schools in their regions. 
So it was really starting with the state, then getting embedded into um, initial statewide initiatives, which personally I think is a terrific way to do it, then building the capacity of regional centers so they could use this content um, at the local level, the regional level, to support districts and schools who really wanted to make a commitment to doing this work. Next slide, John. And then um, the, in the next uh, one was the state again, the same content. Some of it uh, was on, online at this point. And they had a one-year um, implementation with the state and the RCC collaboratively um, engaged in planning and implementing this uh, with the math PD providers across the state. And um, this was mainly led by the Comprehensive Center, but the state did participate. And they used the content of these modules. Some of it was online by that point. So different ways of, of using it. Um, you know, it's perfectly possible that even the school could just take this and um, the leadership of the school decide this is going to be a, a two-year-long or a year-long initiative and we're going to use these materials. Um, so it can really be used from the school level uh, right to the state level, as we saw with one state supporting the department, then into state initiatives um, down to the regional centers. So as I said in the beginning, it's, it's intended to be flexible. Um, it has been piloted. We feel that the content is solid with respect to the research that it's grounded in. And um, we sincerely hope that you think it's useful and might take the opportunity to use it at some point in your regions. So with that, I'm going to stop again. And maybe there are some comments, questions, um, ideas of anybody's Got any ideas bubbling up? We'd love to hear them. And I'm going to unmute all the lines, um, hopefully correctly. All guests have been unmuted. So if you'd like to um, ask a question, either you can use chat, but of course if you'd like to speak on the phone, just tell us who you are so Margaret knows who she's talking to. Uh, John, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Kathleen from Virginia. Um, I know we're working on formative assessment, but is there a way that we can look at all of the modules? Is there, or the facilitator's guide, John? I, I know we're going to be meeting to talk about this, but this seems like, compared to Rick Stegan's work, and we've looked at that as well, we tried that a few years ago with PLCs and it didn't work well. Of course, I think that was prior to um, more web-based and online kind of programming, and I'm thinking how we lay this out will depend on, and I think you went back a slide, if you could, a couple of slides, where you mentioned state expertise. Um, mm -hmm. Go back one more. I think it was this one um, right here. And so the webinars with experts, if we, is there, I mean, I'm thinking through this, but how I would see the experts as being very important because I don't, know how else to get this to a school level. I'm not sure that they have the capacity to get there on their own. So in this particular state, I know this was a two-year project, how did those webinars play into to the overall, what did they do four times a year? Um, well, I, I can tell you because I ran them Okay, <laughs> four times a year. Um, we basic, I basically um, use my formative assessment to decide what the content of the webinar should be based on the face-to-face -face institutes. Um, you know, I could see what they were struggling with or I could see they needed more help in certain areas. So that was one uh, way the content was developed. The second way was that I asked them to bring ideas and things they've been doing um, and showcase them. So we'd have maybe three or four people each time talk about what they'd been doing, some of the challenges, and then it was used as a almost like a, a PLC where we were all talking about, well, what would be a good way forward here. Um, I, I think the access to experts is, is important. Um, 
And as I say, part of why we wanted to build such strong content is that we wanted to get that expert knowledge into the content. But I think it's, it is advantageous if you can have some expertise that's supporting the ongoing implementation as well. I'll say, <clears throat> Kathleen, I'm glad you asked that question because, as you know, we are going to come to Richmond uh, to share these modules. Um, people in other content centers as well as um, SEAs are welcome to come see that uh, introductory session. The idea was to give people more of an in-depth look to the material because there's, as you see, so much information in these modules. And then um, in the different regions, states can work with their comprehensive centers as to a model they'd like to develop. So let's say Virginia would like to develop this. And we had actually planned on maybe developing that um, online community with you, and then you can decide who the experts are, how many times they meet, different kinds of activities. And each um, regional center can work with their states on that as well. The idea yeah, is that – go ahead, Kathleen. No, no, go ahead. I like this model. That's good. Oh, well, I was going to say, you know, simply because – well, funding is on everybody's mind right now, but because funding is limited, getting Margaret all the way up to the East Coast is kind of a special occasion, so we want to make sure that other people who might be kind of close to the region would be able to attend. And, John, if they can't attend, I might be able to arrange to have it um, streaming video. I might be able to. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. Um, um, do you know what the date – This is. we've already scheduled this date. Oh. Right, Friday, November 22nd. Okay, what I will do, if we schedule that date, I will check to see if I can, and if it's a Friday, it's probably possible. I'll check, okay? Okay, okay. and for our uh, fellow comprehensive center staff that are online, uh, please feel free to contact me or Margaret or our coordinator, Kim Cook, about attending that day if you'd like to do that as well. Uh, and we'd love to have you. Or, yeah. 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 Love to have and you for Jason. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful place. And then, um, Margaret and Nancy Grigon asked, how do we access resources if they can't attend that day? Is there a process they go through to um, contact you? Yes, if people want to contact me, I can send them a link and a password uh, so they they can access the the resources. Great, and I'm going to very, you know, before I show Margaret's uh, email address, I'm going to come back to that. I do want to do a very uh, very quick uh, commercial for an assess uh, a webinar going on tomorrow on formal assessment as well from one of the other content centers. If you have not registered, you can go to their website and register there. But if you do need Margaret's contact information, there's her email address. She's very quick to respond. <laughs> I want to know if there are any other questions either on the chat or on the phone. Um, John, I will check, and I think you have probably made that appointment with Shelly in Virginia, Shelly Loving Ryder. Yes. Okay. I will check with Shelly and see if we can make sure that it can be, um, it, we might be able to live stream it, which would be good, because then if they want to join, they can. Okay? Great. Awesome. Thank you. And again, this uh, webinar and this idea of focusing on formal assessment came out of the idea that several states in the Appalachian region that is served by the ARC we're interested in this concept of formative assessment, so we're trying to um, leverage those funds, leverage Margaret's limited time to try and reach as many states as possible, and we're willing to share that work with our other comprehensive centers and, of course, other states who they work with. So at this time, I have 3 o'clock. You do have Margaret's um, email address you want to follow up. If you would like to participate in that Friday, November 22nd date, please feel free to contact me, or you can simply reply to Kim Cook, who sent out all the information for today's webinar. I'd like to thank Margaret. Um, once again, I know there's so much information. You did such a good job getting through it. And if you are like Margaret and you were not able to manipulate the slides or see the slides um, in a way that was uh, beneficial to you, we are testing the system. You will receive an evaluation link, and it would be helpful if you would tell me what operating system and what browser you are using, and I can give that feedback to our technology team. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and I will be in touch with a follow-up uh, email and questionnaire, and thanks again, Margaret. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, John. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay.